there's so much that we know about it, but there's also so much that we don't know about it, um, that you're never going to go out of business trying to learn more about nutrition on the dairy farm. I'm Peggy Coffeen with the Up Level Dairy Podcast, popping in here to the Dairy Podcast Show as your guest host today to put one of your regular hosts, Gail Carpenter, in the hot seat. Now, you may know Gail, Assistant Professor with Dairy Extension Outreach from Iowa State University's Animal Science Department, for her research and her positive impacts on the dairy community. And today, you'll get to learn more about how she got where she is, the purposeful career goal that drives her, and her powerful role as a student mentor. Gail, welcome to your show, The Dairy Podcast Show. It's great to be here. It's kind of fun to be on the other side of the microphone. We'll see how this goes. (laughs) And Gail, yes, this is the other side of the mic for you. And uh, I typically host my podcast, Up Level Dairy, talking about business management and leadership for dairy farmers and dairy professionals. And so this will be a fun change of pace for me because we're digging more into you and who you are, what you do, and how you got to where you're at. And so you've spent most of your career in academia, as well as some time in industry as a nutritionist. But just give us a snap. Shot. Take us back on your career journey of how you got to where you are now. Yeah, I. Uh, it's actually kind of an interesting story. I grew up um, as a in a family of teachers. So my parents are both teachers. My dad teaches high school science, and my mom's an elementary school teacher. Um, but my mom has or had three brothers, and two of them were teachers, and then both of their wives were teachers. So. Uh, all family get togethers were very education heavy. Um, and a lot of, and, and that was always kind of the career that I always saw myself in because I grew up around educators. Um, and so when I got into animal science, I, you know, like a lot of students, I started out wanting to go the, the veterinarian route. Um, and as I kind of progressed through my career, I realized that nutrition was an area that had a lot of interest to me. Um, and as I kind of fell in love with that side, um, of the science, I saw myself as kind of getting into that education uh, career sector um, as a professor. So that was always my my goal when I went to grad school, when I was working on my master's degree and my PhD, is that I wanted to um, wanted to teach undergraduates. Uh, And so that was my first job when I my first big kid job when I finished my PhD um, was at the University of Guelph Ridgetown campus. Um, And I had a 40 percent teaching job there. Uh, really enjoyed it. It was I was working with uh, in Canada. We call them diploma students, but it's it's the two year programs. Uh, and so I was working with two year students over there, um, and really enjoyed that opportunity. Um, but I kind of got. I mean, I I so in my early thirties, I think I was too old for a quarter life crisis, but too young for a midlife crisis. Um, and I'd never really even thought about industry, um, but then started thinking, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, getting outside of the ivory tower, getting some real world experience is something that I want to do. Um, and I had a job, uh, with a nutrition company down in Ohio that I loved. Um, and I really enjoyed, I I learned so much in my time there, um, at, in technical services as a nutritionist. Um, but I missed, um, I really missed that undergraduate education, um, and student mentoring side mm-hmm. of my of my role there. Um, and so when the job came available at Iowa State, I applied for it um, and I got it. Uh, I started at Iowa State actually as a teaching professor. So I had a 75% teaching role. Um, and when, uh, and, and last year they hired a dairy extension specialist at Iowa State. And that was a 60% extension, a 20% research, 20% teaching job. Um, and so I, I applied for that one and I officially started my current position about a year ago in July, 2022. Um, so it's been, I tell people now I have the perfect job. I get to be out, um, I get to be out in industry working with producers in my extension role, um, and really getting boots on the ground, uh, and getting to see what's actually going on in, in Iowa, in the Midwest, in the dairy industry. Um, but I also get to do research and I get to work with um, some of our really stellar undergraduates, uh, especially uh, those that are really excited about dairy and, and want to go out and, and get jobs in the dairy industry. So I ended up, I took a kind of a long route to get here, but I ended up, I think, with my dream job. So, And let's add to your resume, podcast host. Was that in exactly, your career yes. plans as well? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it was part of my career plans, but um, 
it's it's definitely an enjoyable part of my job. Uh, I get to I get to log on and meet new people and have conversations with all sorts of people who are doing some really exciting things and and it's really great. I get to it doesn't feel like work. I just get to sit and talk to people and pick their brains. So a healthy digestive tract is a prerequisite for overall calf health and performance. It affects the absorption and utilization of nutrients and also has an influence on the calf's immune system. Digesteron Calf from DSM Firminish is a phytogenic product that can help benefit gut bacteria to improve gut functionality, immunity, and performance. Take care of your calves with Digesteron Calf. Visit dsm.com forward slash Digesteron to learn more. So Gail, what I'm hearing and as you share this story is that teaching is part of your nature, part of where you came from, part of how you grew up, and part of what has always called you back to, to the center. And, uh, and and you mentioned that you found a love for nutrition as well in your time um, through your collegiate experience and your school experience. Uh, so what was it about dairy nutrition specifically that, that lit a spark in you and and really caused you to pursue that as your specialty? Well, so I'm definitely a nerd, um, first of all. So uh, nutrition is really exciting, I think, from a scientific perspective and understanding all of the mechanisms that go into producing high quality milk with healthy cows. Um, a lot of that falls back to the feed and, and it really scratches my itch on the science side. Um, but also it's so important, um, in terms of the whole farm system, right. And how you, how you're storing your forages, how you're, how you're create, um, how you're producing your forages, um, how you're, how you're mixing the ration, how you're delivering it to the cows and it, and it plays in with cow comfort and, and our facilities and management. And, and it touches so many things and it's touched by so many things on the farm, um, that it really is just, it's fascinating to dig into all of the nutrition environmental interactions that are out there. Um, and it's also just like, it's, it's so important when it comes to um, the farm business and the economics of how the farm runs and farm profitability. And it's just, it's, there's so much that we know about it, but there's also so much that we don't know about it um, that you're never going to go out of business trying to learn more about nutrition on the dairy farm. Job security. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but really, it sounds like when you think about nutrition and what you saw as you dug into it more was that it is really the central point that affects so many other aspects, whether it's the cows, as you said, or the business side. And uh, and I think that speaks to uh, something that you shared. This is actually right straight from your LinkedIn bio. Um, so I'm going to, to share that with the listeners here. And you talk about how this book, Grit, by Angela Duckworth urges readers to identify their top level purposeful goal for their lives and careers. You say yours is to leverage the land grant university model to drive a more just and sustainable dairy industry. Tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that. Oh, there's so much, uh, there's so much that goes into that. That's, it's going to be hard to answer quickly. Um, and honestly, the purpose, the point of Angela Duckworth's comment that you need to have a single singular top level goal is to kind of filter out the things that aren't important. Um, mm -hmm. But then I made my top level goal just so all encompassing that it's really hard to filter things out. So I'm not sure if I really understood the assignment on that one. Um, but that's where the, the sustainable side, I think, is really where uh, that nutrition um, can can leverage uh, improve farm sustainability. And, and we're talking about sustainability, not just on the environmental side. The environmental side's definitely important, but we want, we want producers to be able to stay in business as long as they want to stay in business. And if they have a next generation that they want to be able to pass that farm along to, we want them to be able to do that. Um, so when we think about sustainability, we can't just look, obviously we should look at the environmental footprint and, and what we're, um, what our environmental impacts are, but we also need to be looking at who the producers are themselves as people and what their goals are and what keeps them going and what makes them want to pass it along to the next generation. Um, and I think that's where the justice side of it comes in too. And, and we need to make sure that there's, there's a place for everybody in the dairy industry, right? And regardless of your race, gender, um, identity, uh, you know, your, your, sexual orientation or whatever it else, whatever else there is, uh, we need to make sure that all, all, all people who are in the dairy industry feel welcome, uh, and feel like they have a, that they, that they're, um, 
driving the industry forward as they see fit. Um, and so I'm a big believer, you know, there's room for big farms and small farms and uh, multi-generational farms and new farms. And um, I, I really believe in the idea of infinite diversity and infinite combinations. Um, and I think the dairy industry becomes more sustainable um, and is able to continue growing and improving and being its best self when we um, make a big tent and allow um, allow everybody who wants to participate to be a part of it. Ah, oh, Gail, that is incredible. And and I think what you just shared with us, it really shines this light that what drives you and where your purpose and passion comes from is when you see a cow, you're not just seeing a cow. You're seeing the you're seeing an an accessory to the growth and success of a business, of a farm, but ultimately of the people and of the environment and of the bigger picture and the future. And that's a really strong and powerful purpose. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, so, you know, when we talk about that, that drive that you have to really, you know, leverage the land grant university model, let's just visit for a moment about the research side. I mean, this is the tech side. This is what you often are asking people about on the dairy podcast show is the research that they're doing its impacts and telling those stories. And so I'm curious, what are you working on right now? And what are you most excited about in your lab, in your work and your research to deliver on your purpose. Yeah. So I, um, I, again, stick my fingers in a lot of different pies. Um, and because I do have all three legs of the three, the three legged stool and the land grant model or the three pillars, if you want to call them pillars, there's a whole bunch of different ways that people will identify, um, the three parts of the rent land grant model. So those are going to be extension research and teaching. Um, and because I'm heavy on the extension side and a little lighter on the research side, a lot of my research program is driven by what our, what our stakeholders and what our producers have identified as a major need. Um, so my main overarching interest, uh, again, is, is that sustainability of the dairy industry, um, especially from an environmental, but also from a, from a societal side of things. Um, and, uh, so I've done a little bit of research and looking at alternative forages. Uh, so some of the research that I did at the university of Guelph, um, was looking at switchgrass as a replacement for wheat straw. So looking at some of these forages that maybe have a lower, uh, lower footprint and maybe a little bit cheaper, um, to see how we can, incorporate those into dairy rations. Um, but some stuff that I've been working on recently that doesn't necessarily fit into what I thought I'd be studying, um, is some of this, uh, uh work in beef on dairy. Um, oh, I'm yeah. really excited about adult cow nutrition and never had a huge interest in calves. Um, but the, <laughs> but here I am doing calf research now. Um, and that's been, I have a graduate student who does love calves. So that's made it her, her enthusiasm is contagious. So I think I enjoy calf work a little bit more than I did when we started her project. Um, but we really were hearing from in Iowa, from the beef industry, as well as the dairy industry, that we need a better idea of how to raise healthy, um, high quality beef crosses, uh, dairy beef crosses. So um, that's been a lot of our focus over the past few months is looking at different um, feeding strategies, pre weaning, and we're collaborating with our with our beef team to look at some uh, transition strategies from that pre weaning to post weaning. Um, the exciting thing about that project is that we actually get to track those calves calves to steers to finish, uh, and so we're actually going to be able to um, collect individual data on those animals um, from the day that they enroll onto that project at 24 hours of age or less, all the way until harvest. Um, so we're going to collect a ton of information on those uh, and hopefully give us um, a good understanding of some of the efficiencies, um, average daily gain, feed to gain, um, some of those uh, productive qualities of the beef on dairy cross. So that's been taking up a bunch of my time recently. Um, and I kind of, you know, maybe enjoy calves a little bit more than I thought I did. They are, especially those beef crosses, 
They're super cute. They are um, super cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and so a project like this, I mean, this is a several year project because the uniqueness here is you're starting with the calf and following all the way to harvest and the data that you'll be able to collect from that full chain of the process is super exciting. And so any, any gut inclination of what any, of what any of the key takeaways, at least from the early work that you've done here um, with those calves, any, any gut instinct of something that you think is really valuable that you're seeing already? So one of the things that we're taking away um, is that the management of these beef on dairy calves is incredibly important in early life. And that sounds mm -hmm. I'm super obvious, <laughs> but it's <laughs> not necessarily obvious to anybody. And I think uh, when, when beef on dairy first started emerging as a strategy, it seemed like a lot of um, or maybe not a lot, but it seemed like some producers were thinking of them as more of a byproduct. Like we needed the pregnancy of that cow. So we needed the cow to have a calf. Uh, and so this calf is just kind of a byproduct of needing that pregnancy for the cow to start lactating. And that meant that sometimes they weren't getting as high of quality of colostrum. They weren't being managed as intensive, intensively around um, in those first 24 hours. And we know that those are incredibly important. Dairy producers are fantastic at raising replacement heifers. And they have um, that, that, uh, that, that calving protocol. They have that nailed down, that colostrum protocol. Um, we know we've done a lot of research in that area. We know what we should be doing. Um, but I think for some people, it was easy to maybe not give those beef cock cross calves quite the same level of care and quality of care as the heifers were getting. And I think we're seeing in today's market with the, uh, especially with the, you know, the national cow herds down on the beef side. Uh, and so there's a, there's a big demand for these beef on dairy animals. I think we're seeing a renewed appreciation um, for the importance of these calves uh, and making sure that they get, they get off on the right foot. So a lot of our uh, messaging to producers has been, don't think of these calves as a byproduct of your dairy farm. Think of them as they're actually an asset to your dairy farm. And you need to be investing in that asset just as much as you would be investing in your replacements. And dairy producers are great at that, right? They've been, they know how to, how to dial down on that first eight weeks and make sure that we're getting those heifers off on the right foot. And so just making sure that we're giving that same quality of care to our beef animals um, is incredibly important. Would you would you describe it as kind of a paradigm sh a paradigm shift where you know like you said people producers out there are so good at knowing what to do with those replacement heifers that they can look at and say, I know that I'm going to milk this calf as a cow someday. She's going to come in in two years and I'm going to set her up with all the goodies that she needs to be successful. But it's a paradigm shift to look at that cross calf or, you know, as a, as an asset, as a value add. And, um, and I think, do you think that we've come a long way in the less in a short order when we really look at, uh, the progress? Progression of beef on dairy um, and where we started, where it was kind of a any straw from a Angus bull will do to having a more precision approach to producing a high quality beef animal. Do you think we've had some victories in that arena already? Absolutely. I think, uh, I, I mean, you say paradigm shift and to some extent I agree with that, except I think we're actually in the middle of a paradigm shift right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, the, the researchers and the producers I talk to, there's so many questions that we have on what genetics should we be using? Um, how do we, you know, how are we supposed to be managing these calves in early life and transitioning them from that, that dairy environment to a beef environment? Um, where are these liver abscesses coming from? Is there an environmental uh, mm -hmm. impact of that? Or is it, you know, is it, is it mostly nutrition? What, where exactly are some of these issues coming from? And I think it's, it's going to be really exciting to see over the next few years as that paradigm continues to shift where we end up and what impact that has on the dairy and beef industries. It's been really great for me because it's brought me, um, it's made a lot of connections with me to our beef team um, mm. and and helped me kind of understand that beef industry a little bit better. And I think our, our my collaborators are understanding the dairy industry a little bit better. Um, and so I think it's really exciting to see how these two industries can kind of join forces because we've both been kind of off in our own camps doing our own thing for a while. Um, but But if we can come together and really understand 
how to manage these beef crosses, I think that also makes us better producers, both dairy producers and beef producers. So it'll be really yeah. interesting to see what the next few years bring. That is, it's interesting and exciting. And uh, it's it's kind of funny because like, you know, did you ever really cross department lines in the past like you do now? Was it kind of like, here's dairy science over here and there's the... <laughs> <laughs> the other side <laughs> we don't go we don't we don't hang out with them now like now there's an, an extreme collaboration because there's a vested interest on both parties do you see that has that changed do you, do you notice that as a change in just those conversations and communication oh for sure and it's actually funny because my office suite is actually the same suite as our uh our, our iowa beef center um so i share the same suite as as a lot of our beef extension and beef researchers um and you know we have lunch together we 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 see each other every day um but actually getting to the point where we're digging in on some of these issues it's really uh it's been great um just getting to know my colleagues a little bit better and, and hearing more about their dairy industry and one of the things I, or their beef industry, sorry. Uh, one of the things that I've grown to appreciate about the dairy industry since we've been collaborating more closely with our beef colleagues is just the sheer amount of data that we collect mm -hmm. um, and how great we are at keeping records and the importance of um, like DHI testing and, and some of these other, uh, you know, software companies where we're, we're, we're entering every, or, or, some farms anyway, we have the ability to be able to enter every event. Um, even if you're not doing event entry, a lot of farms are still on test day. And so you have individual cow data um, on the on the component side and the production side. And you understand that cows, um, you understand that cow, I think, to the level that, that beef producers don't necessarily get to understand. And so um, I think I've, I've gained a new appreciation um, I think we still have a lot more data that we can be collecting on the dairy side. And I think a lot of our precision technologies will be helping us do that. But I've gained a lot of appreciation for just the sheer amount of understanding that we have about how our cows are managed and how they're performing. Yeah. Excellent. And, and so, I mean, we just talked a little bit about some of this research that you're doing that is exciting and we'll have some, uh, hopefully exciting outcomes that you'll be able to share with your outreach work in the dairy community and on the beef side in a few years. Uh, but research isn't the only thing that you do, Gail. In fact, you're a dairy challenge coach. You're an advisor to undergrad and graduate students and being a mentor in these capacities is a role that you step into with joy and enthusiasm. And so I'm curious, you know, with, with your career, uh, who has been your mentor? You're a mentor to so many others. Who mentored you? I actually, I think I've been lucky in my life to have several uh, very good mentors. So um, my, I always think of my my 4-H judging coach who then turned into my collegiate judging coach and one of my undergraduate advisors, uh, Joe Domek at Michigan State, um, was one of my very early mentors in, in the dairy world. Um, also really, really thankful to be mentored by Marshall Stern at the University of Minnesota. He was my master's advisor as well as actually one of my co-hosts now. Um, Barry Bradford was my PhD advisor and mentor. And so I think I've been lucky at, at several steps of my career to be plugged in um, to such great, um, great mentors and, and, and people who have, um, I really respect and look up to. And I think that, you know, in my early career, I was always thinking about, well, what would Joe do in this situation? Or what would Barry do in this situation? And I think something that as I, you know, as I'm, uh, the longer I'm doing my job, the more often I think of, well, this might be what, what they would have done, but, but maybe adding my own flair to things a little bit. And, um, I don't have to be exactly like either of them to be, uh, to be the best mentor to students. So, um, but still, uh, still very close with them, um, and still get to see them as often as I can and, and, and feel like I can always, if I have a question or a concern, I can always reach out. Yeah. And that's, that's the beauty of the network of the dairy community, right? So yep. did you have a little bracelet that says like WWJD and WWBD? <laughs> what would Barry do? <laughs> what would no, you I <laughs> Maybe I should, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you should make some that say, what would Gail do? Because yes. <laughs> you are now, you are the mentor to so many others. And so Gail, when you think about the mentors that you had, the impact that they've had on you, the way you still carry that with you, as you just shared, and then you look at 
at the students in your lab. You look at the students that you coach on Dairy Challenge. You look at the students that you sit down and advise. What kind of mentor do you want to be for them? I think a lot of mentoring, at least for me, when I look at the at the folks who I was mentored by and the students that I sit down with um, and have the, the, the ability to, to mentor and talk to, a lot of it comes back to psychological safety and feeling like you're in a safe place where you can, not to be too much of a millennial here and talk about safe spaces, but, but uh, before safe spaces were even cool, I felt like, you know, um, people like Joe I could go to and I could talk to. And it was, it was a judgment free zone, right? Like, and, and you can, a place where you can feel safe to kind of hash out, you know, I think maybe I screwed this up. Um, or I think, uh, you know, this might turn into a problem or, um, you know, that's that sort of thing, being able to offer a space to be like, Hey, you know what, I might have done this wrong, or I might be, I'm not sure about this. This is something I don't know. Um, and I'm worried about, I think, I think a lot of times, especially with, um, younger students I deal with, uh, there's this idea that, oh, I can never mess up and I can never be wrong. And if there's something I don't know, then that's a problem. And that's a, that's a, there's, they have a very strong inner critic on a lot of things and modeling the fact that, Hey, you know what? Half of science is actually getting things wrong. Um, there's a great book that I read uh, a couple years ago now, think again by Adam Grant that really challenged how I think about you know, you don't have to be right about everything all the time. And and actually there's a lot of value in rethinking things that you previously were convinced were true. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's something I always try to, to model with my students when I'm dealing with them and provide them a space to be like, you know what, maybe we don't know the answer to this. How would we figure out that answer? How can we troubleshoot this? Um, and you know what, maybe you messed, maybe you messed something up or, uh, didn't collect something quite right, but you know that's in the past, and what we need to figure out is is what's our best way to move forward. Mm-hmm. And so, as a mentor, you want to be that person that your students look at you and feel comfortable being honest, being vulnerable, expressing their their fears sometimes, and probably sharing in their victories and excitement too. Uh, but also to lead by example, as you as you just illustrated there, Gail, of of how sometimes we don't have all the answers, and even when you are in the seat that you're in, a brilliant success professor and researcher that sometimes there's still things that you're learning and discovering and that that is true leadership by example and uh, and what a gift you are to the students that you get to work with and who get to work with you and so you know let's talk about those students for a moment uh, you touch the lives of a lot of young people and I know that there are a lot of um, students and young professionals that listen to the dairy podcast show so what advice would you have for them as they are finishing their education, furthering their education, preparing to enter the career field? What do you tell them about the, the keys to success in this profession, in this industry? Yeah. So one of the things that I always talk to students about, and I had a colleague at the University of Guelph, John Kant, uh, and I heard him say this to a student one time, and I was like, oh, you said that perfectly. And now I can't actually remember how he said it, um, but it was a lot of a lot of times when students are either starting college or finishing college. There's this idea that I have to pick the right major, mm. or I have to pick the right. What if I like you stress out over which minor you're going to take, which major you're going to take, what internship am I going to do, what's my first job going to be, and a lot of and I've been there too, right? We've all, I'm sure you have too, Peggy. You you kind of have this idea that you know this is this is going to be the next step for the rest of my life, and if I screw this up, then then I'm like off on the wrong foot for the rest of my life, and. And I think a lot of times it helps students to like take that pressure off that decision. And, and what John said was something to the extent of you're, you're the right job to take after college or after grad school or whatever it is, the right job to take is the job that you take, right? Mm-hmm. So if you have three job offers, 
you know, pick the one that you want the most. Don't stress out about, and, and the one that can pay the bills, obviously, that's still important. Um, you know, the one that's going to give you that work-life balance that you need or, or and fill your priorities that, that you have as a person. I have my priorities. They might not look the same to, to the person next to me. Um, but, but taking some of that stress off yourself, I think, is a lot of when I'm talking to students about making choices and making decisions, I encourage them to just take a step back and, and, and kind of release some of that pressure on, well, what's this going to have an impact on me five years down the road or 10 years down the road? And what it's going to, then the impact that it's going to have on you is that you're going to have experience from a job (laughs) and you might have experience 10 years down the road. You might have experience from two jobs, right? Uh, And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and so taking that first step and getting that first job, you don't know what your dream job is going to be until you actually have gone out and gotten your feet wet in the industry for a little bit and tried different things. I know I've, like we kind of talked about at the beginning, I've gone through a few different career changes, uh, in my short career here. Um, and I feel like at each one, I've, I've gotten a lot of value, just in terms of my technical skill set, but also in terms of really understanding what I value in a, in a career and in a position. Um, and so I talked about giving industry a try a little while. And, and to me, the important thing that I needed was that, was that student interaction and that teaching and educating and mentoring. Um, and that's something that I realized, you know, that that's not just standing and lecturing because I got the chance in that job to give lectures, to give, you know, to provide information, to do that knowledge translation, but it can't, but to me, I'm not satisfied if it stops with that. I have to have um, more in-depth um, and, and deeper deeper connections with these students to be able to, for me to get professional satisfaction out of that. And that's nothing, That's something I wouldn't have known if I hadn't tried a couple different things first. Yeah. Um, and so just not being, not, the advice that I usually give kind of boils down to don't stress about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, just, you know, Take, take all the information you can get, take advice from different people, but don't stress out that you're going to make a decision and it's going to be the wrong decision. The right decision is going to be the decision that you make. And even if it's not a job that you stay in for the rest of your life, you're going to learn something out about it. Um, you're going to learn what you need out of, out of your leadership, what you need um, from a technical side. Um, and so just worry less. Such a you you make it all sound simple and boil it down to <laughs> two simple words worry less and yep. uh, and I'm guessing that if I were to tap some of your students on the shoulder or previous students that uh, they would say yep that's something either Gail said directly or indirectly <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and what a again what a gift you are to them and in their lives as they navigate those changes navigate those decisions, but ultimately, because as you're having those conversations, you're leading by your own example, Gail. It's time for our famous three. Natural Biologics is using cutting-edge science to deliver cost-effective solutions for the animal health and productivity challenges you face. For conventional or organic production systems, Natural Biologics can help support rumen health and immune function, mitigate pathogens, and increase production efficiency. Visit naturalbiologics.com to learn more. And so as uh, as we get to the end of this dairy podcast show here, we're going to turn the tables on you once again, Gail, because there are a couple questions that you like to ask people at the end of your episodes. You get to answer them yourself today. Yeah. And so, yeah. So one of the first I've questions. I've thought about these a lot because you, you I about, ask them every show. <laughs> so have you, been, have you been waiting for someone to just finally ask you? <laughs> A little bit, yeah. A little bit, yeah. Okay, well, it's your time to shine. So the first question is, what is your favorite dairy-related book or resource? So my favorite dairy-related book or research, sorry, book or resource is Large Dairy Herd Management, um, the the textbook uh, that is available through ADSA. Um, the, le- the recent edition, um, the third edition came out in 2016, 2017, something like that. Um, and it is an ebook. It's available on PDF. Uh, students get a reduced price on it. And actually, if you have an SPAC membership, you get a reduced price on it too. Um, but it is 
especially for things that are outside of my area of expertise, it's a first stop that I go to, to, to brush up on things that I don't necessarily deal with every day. So, um, if I need like a, like a tune up on mastitis or repro or things mm -hmm. that are a little bit outside of my regular wheelhouse, it's the first place I always go. Um, I, pro that's good information for students as well that are kind of, um, trying to, to get a handle on, on different aspects of the dairy industry. It's a, it's written by, I wrote one of the chapters, uh, Barry and I actually co-wrote one of the chapters. Um, it's a, it's written by experts in the field in that area. And it's just incredibly practical, but also, um, very evidence-based, um, and scientific. So, um, hands down so, best, best resource I can recommend. So that's your go-to. And what was your chapter on? Uh, it was byproduct feeds, uh -huh. feeding byproducts. So. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Now we're going to go the opposite route. What is your favorite non-dairy related book or resource? What, so what is next to your bed right now? Yeah. <laughs> so I, um, I, I mentioned a couple books actually in our interview today that I love that I've read recently. Um, so grit, uh, that we mentioned at the beginning, that was a fantastic read. I read that in the past, past year. Um, and I mentioned Adam Grant's book, Think Again. Um, but my favorite, so anything by Adam Grant, um, oh. I, I love. Uh, yes, he's an organizational I love him too. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. He's also a great follow on LinkedIn. His podcast is fantastic. Um, his, so anything that he's written, I just devour. Um, I just read, and so my current, Think Again was my answer to that question until I read uh, a book of his that he actually wrote a few years ago now. It's called Give and Take. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that has now become my go-to answer to that question. Um, it's about givers and takers and, and how to, um, the importance of being a giver and being somebody who, you know, is, is driven to help others. Um, but it also has some practical advice in there about how to be a giver without becoming a doormat. Ooh. Um, and so I think it, I need to read that one. It is very good. I highly recommend it. So awesome. Thanks for sharing that good read with us, but, uh, Okay. Gail, so I also uh, had read that you have a goal this year of reading 75 books. Yes. <laughs> okay, so we are now it, well into 2023. How are you doing on your goal? I am actually, so I'm on Goodreads. Um, and if anybody else is on Goodreads, you should follow me. My handle what is, is Goodreads. Goodreads good is read? social media for readers. Oh. Um, so you post what you're reading. Um, and uh books that you want to read and um books that and you can rate and review books on there um and it's it's fantastic i try to get all of my friends onto goodreads um but it's social media for readers basically um and that's where i've been keeping track of uh, so if you want to follow me on there anybody can follow me i'm um at galileo so it's g-a-i-l-i-l-e-o uh, and I have in 2023 so far read 59 books. Whoa. The Some of those are audio books. So I do, I do double dip a little bit by, by having a hard copy and, uh, in an audio book at the same time. So, um, but yeah, I'm at, I'm at 59. Well, congratulations. You are well on your way, Gail. You're going to hit that goal for 2023, 75 books, 59 down and a few more to go. Are you yep. just going to read like short ones between now and the end of the year? To, to I get actually there faster? picked up, uh, it's called The Priority of the Orange Tree and it is no joke. It is like a four inch thick book, maybe three inch thick book. Um, okay. That so counts as four. You can count that as four books. Come on. <laughs> So there's a couple novellas that are in there, like shorter books that are in there too. But I try to balance out the short reads with a couple long reads as well. So I, I try to keep it. I try to keep it fair. Oh, I love it. I love it. Uh, and Gail, okay, third question for you. The question that you ask everybody else now is in your court. What sets successful dairy professionals apart from those who are not? So I my first instinct when I hear this question and I've had uh, guests who have said this before, and I don't think, I think it's definitely true. Um, I really, I, I love the sentiment and it's to become a lifelong learner. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I definitely believe that I definitely believe that that does make dairy professionals successful, but because a lot of people have already said that, 
Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to pick a different answer and it kind of ties in with some of the other stuff that we've talked about today while we've been recording and it's don't forget the people. Mm -hmm. Um, the people that you work with are important. Um, the people, uh, your colleagues, uh, the dairy producers, your clients, whoever it is, the people are an important aspect an important asset of the dairy industry. And they're what actually makes the dairy industry run. Um, so a lot of what we talk about with my with my students in class and dairy challenge while we're coaching is that um, you know you can have the best you can have the best practices on paper you can have all the SOPs you can understand all of the science you can understand everything about what makes a dairy run but if you don't have people who are actually doing the work in the right way then it doesn't count. Um, one of my colleagues always says that most of the problems on farm have a first name and a last name. Um, <laughs> And, and most of the successes on farm, all of the successes on farm are going to have a first name and a last name as well. Um, so making sure that you don't forget the importance of not just the science and not just the, you know, best practices and, and all the procedures and checklists, but making sure that you understand the people that you work with and the people that you consult with is incredibly important to making sure um, that the, the dairy industry is growing and thriving. Oh, and Gail, what you just shared in summary here and the focus on people and also lifelong learning, it's like a beautiful bow that just wrapped up the entire conversation. And, uh, and here again, this is what makes you successful in what you're doing. Lifelong learner and teacher and the focus on the people. And so Gail, has it been fun being in the hot seat today? This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm excited to get back to being the interviewer, um, but it has been <laughs> enjoyable to be the interviewee as well. <laughs> oh, excellent. Well, hey, thanks for letting me jump on. And again, I'm Peggy Coffin from the Up Level Dairy Podcast. And if you're looking for more conversations for dairy farmers and dairy professionals around business management and leadership related to dairy farming, you can hear them each week from me on the Up Level Dairy Podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and Amazon Music. Thanks for letting me jump in, my friends, with the Dairy Podcast Show.